um, on this indoors on a beautiful spring afternoon. Um, but we know we have a great talk coming with Mark joining us. Um, I'm Lucy Helfrich, Director of Program Services for the 300 Committee Land Trust of Falmouth. We're really glad to have you all joining us for this special talk by Mark Faraday on the Cape Cod Osprey Project. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. We'd like to keep you all muted during the presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the chat feature and we'll address questions at the end of the talk. We are recording the talk and the recording will be available on the 300 Committee's YouTube channel pretty much as soon as it's done, I think, I hope. Fingers crossed. Um, today's talk is jointly presented by the 300 Committee and Salt Pond Area's Bird Sanctuaries. For those of you who might not be familiar with Salt Pond, the organization has been preserving natural and beautiful lands in Falmouth since 1962, making it the oldest, um, the oldest private conservation group on the Cape. Their feature properties include Bourne Farm, the Knob and Salt Pond places I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Salt Pond's happy to collaborate with the 300 Committee on this talk as educating the public about na the natural world is also one of their top priorities. The 300 Committee, since 1985, has been preserving open space in Falmouth, oak and pine woods, rugged moraine, riverfront, upland, rare wildlife habitat, salt marsh, farmland, coastal and inland ponds, and more for conservation, recreation, habitat, and clean drinking water. We are so grateful to our many members who support this work and enabling us to continue to save important lands, to manage and steward these lands, and to pr provide outreach and educational programming for the public. If you're not a member, we do hope you will join us. Um, and now, a few words about our speaker, Mark Faraday. Mark, since 2007, has been the science coordinator at Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary and has led birding trips for Mass Audubon since 2002. While he oversees a wide variety of research from oyster reef restoration and turtle monitoring to bats and butterflies, his primary focus is bird ecology. Mark's Bird Report, a weekly essay on bird life, airs each Wednesday on WCAI, the Cape and Islands NPR station, and he also co-hosts Bird News, a monthly call-in show all about birds on CAI's The Point with Mindy Todd, and I'm sure you all have heard him on the radio. <laughs> When COVID first hit a year ago, this talk on the Cape Cod Osprey Project was one of our first casualties and we were devastated. But today we are delighted to be able to present it on the second day of spring, a time of hope and just in time for the annual return of these wonderful birds to our area. Mark, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Lucy. Um, I love the 300 committee and Falmouth and, and um, I'm always happy to talk to you guys and, and talk about ospreys. Uh, perfect time. They're just about ready to, the floodgates are just about ready to open and we'll be surrounded by ospreys any second. Let me share my screen here. Oh, supposed to see that. All right. Cape Cod Osprey Project, voyeuristic citizen science, where we ask otherwise nice upstanding people to peer into the sex lives of our local ospreys, um, but they seem to be okay with it. Um, so just, to, so I'm the science coordinator at Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, which is now part of Mass Audubon's Cape Cod Sanctuaries. Um, we're sort of in the midst of a, a little bit of a restructuring, not, not much change from your perspective. It's more of an, more of an internal change, but um, some of the projects that I oversee um, include our coastal water bird work with nesting piping plovers, least terns, American oyster catchers, um, our diamondback terrapin work, which is mostly overseen by our former director, Bob Prescott, who's been doing it for close to 40 years. Um, our sea turtle work, uh, which is mostly Bob as well. Bird banding we do, here's a, a beautiful magnolia warbler. Um, we do public bird banding demonstrations. We do that every, every spring and fall. Um, I oversee our horseshoe crab um, research, monitoring and, and advocacy work where we um, do spawning surveys for horseshoe crabs and button tagging. Um, mark recapture work, and we try to turn that research into advocacy for better management of, of these guys and many other things. 
Um, you know, I oversee our land management at the sanctuary that, that we do to benefit rare and declining species. Um, oh, and then there's and then there's the Osprey project, which is sort of happening in the background quietly. Um, not quite the way it used to, but so those of us doing things with ospreys now are standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say. Um, it's a, it's an important conservation story, and I'll get to that. But there's some people in, in Massachusetts who did a lot of the early heavy lifting to bring this species back. And the first is Gil Fernandez down in the Westport River population down there in Bristol County, South Dartmouth. And so that was one of the last places that had ospreys at the, towards the end of the DDT era. And he just about single-handedly brought back that population, um, putting up poles, bringing chicks back from New York, that kind of thing. So a giant. And then in the academic side of things with that same population, um, a Falmouth guy here, Alan Poole. Um, some of you guys probably know Alan. Um, and he, you know, he wrote the book on ospreys really is a lot of what we know about ospreys he has um, put together and compiled in, in his books or has discovered himself through his research. So Alan Poole is a big deal in the world of ospreys. Gus Ben David is going to single-handedly brought back the Martha's Vineyard population, put up pretty much every pole out there as far as I know. He was the director of Mass Audubon's Felix Neck Sanctuary for a long time out there and now he He's just doing his own thing and, and still doing a lot with raptors and, and with ospreys on the vineyard. Uh, Rob Beauregard, his academic um, counterpart there on the vineyard, going back to the 70s at least, studying that, that population of ospreys as it recovered. Um, and also he's doing some important work, still um, satellite tracking ospreys and looking at their migration, both adults and juveniles. And I'll get to that later. <laughs> some local some local folks here uh if you see these two guys in orange on a dark wooded path don't be alarmed they're friendly and mostly harmless this is um kevin Friel and mike tucker and and kevin is doing not working with me i'm aware that he's doing this project now where he's inventorying osprey poles around falmouth many of which i don't have in my database or know about i mean it's just absurd how many are, are there um, and so I'm excited to get together with Kevin when he's done mapping those and see if he'll let me absorb those into my database. And um, I know Mike was instrumental in getting a new pole up um, down on Surf Drive somewhere, I think, and, and trying to remember it was last year. And then Chris Walls from Mass Audubon's Long Pasture Sanctuary um, has helped. And he, he puts up poles using um, six by sixes, not the old telephone poles and they seem to do very well. Um, and so, you know, we work with Chris and Chris works with others getting poles up as needed, but we don't have a ton of capacity to do that. I'll talk about that more later. And you, <laughs> this is a very recent photo of Nancy McDonald um, that I, <laughs> I just screen captured a few minutes ago. And I was looking for a picture of Nancy cause she's, she's my best Falmouth Osprey volunteer, stalwart, uh, long running volunteer monitoring a lot of nests around Falmouth for me every year, helping out with um, some of the Eversource issues that, that we've had and, uh, you know, speaking up on behalf of the Ospreys. And so thanks to Nancy, she does a, does a lot of good work in that area. Um, so this is, a, this is not a, a local bird, this is a, a global bird, really. Um, I mean, you can see, you can find them pretty much if you need, if you need to, at some point, Lucy, you can just do mute all, and then I'll get the hint and unmute myself. You know, we we have to do that sometimes. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So they're they're widely distributed across the northern hemisphere as breeding birds, but they also there are resident populations in the Caribbean, and I suspect other places where it's sort of hard to figure out what ospreys are doing in the Southern hemisphere because there are always ospreys. Our ospreys are always in the Southern hemisphere. Um, there's never a time 
when all of the ospreys come back north because the young ones don't come back north in their first year. And so there are year and a half old ospreys from Falmouth in Brazil, uh, Peru. Um, and then, you know, there are year and a half old European ospreys in Africa. So it's hard, it, it, it's hard to tell what's going on with them sometimes, but they are, they are everywhere. They are globetrotters. This is um, eBird data. So this is actual sightings up to the minute by birders around the world. It's kind of showing that, that same basic pattern all the way up to, wow, looks like there was one in Arrow, Alaska, and then all the way down to Southern South America and, and South Africa and Australia. So big get around. A lot of words on this slide, but it's an important history. So it, you probably know this, but between the, the 50s and the 70s, um, the osprey population crashed and, you know, focusing on this New York to Boston population was reduced by 90%. I mean, they were hanging on by a thread. Um, a couple of pairs left in Connecticut, uh, you know, three or five or something like that. A, a handful left in Massachusetts, just on the Westport River. And we, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, osprey studies are what helped get persistent pesticides banned, DDT in particular. Um, RTP is Roger Tory Peterson uh, working with Rachel Carson. And so Roger Tory Peterson was the one who was noticing that all of the nests were empty. So there were a lot of ospreys and they live a long time. So, you know, it sort of masked the decline initially because they lived 25 years, um, but they weren't fledging any young. And so he, he noticed that on the Connecticut River that the osprey nests were empty. And then Rachel Carson, you know, of course, wrote Silent Spring um, and she died two years after that, but she was advocating for um, the banning of, of DDT. And then Paul Spitzer was a researcher who actually figured out what was happening by moving eggs between populations um, and doing other things. He figured out that the eggshells were thin in the areas impacted by DDT and, and that no chicks were hatching. Um, so this led to the banning of DDT. This was a big success story in the kind of early environmental movement. Um, and now, you know, from in the seventies where there's maybe one pair left, now they're over 300. Uh, we'll get into some of this other stuff more. <clears throat> so this, these are some slides that I got from Rob Beauregard that show in 10 year increments, the recovery of the Southern New England population. You'll notice there's nothing for the Cape because nobody was really keeping track. So there is, there is no, um, there's no data for the Cape for this period, but you get the idea. So starting in 1969, very few left Westport river here, um, the vineyard, a couple of pairs left. The size of like the biggest of these is more than 35 pairs and the smallest is just one to five. Ten years later, they're, they're starting to come back. People are putting up poles. The DDT has been banned. There's endangered species laws. Um, Ten years later, 1989, they're starting to move inland a little bit. The populations are growing. The coast, the traditional coastal spots, 1999, even more. And then by 2009, they're, they're marching inland. And this really doesn't include Massachusetts data beyond the Westport River there. And now, I mean, they're way inland. They're nesting on big lakes and reservoirs, um, in the interior, all through the continent, really. Um, but it, this shows you the recovery of the population here. Uh, same thing. This is Mass Audubon's State of the Birds. And this in particular is the Breeding Bird Atlas that Mass Audubon did first between 1975 and 1979. And you can see same thing. Ospreys were just, just a few left on the south coast and, and the vineyard. And this was, you know, five years of people looking. It's not hard to find osprey nests. So then Mass Audubon redid the Breeding Bird Atlas in 2007 to 2011 and big difference. So this is this is recovery. I mean, this is very exciting and very satisfying for the, the conservation community. Okay. 
you know, the same thing, just increasing, increasing everywhere. So they're back, they're common. You guys in Falmouth are swatting them away like so many mosquitoes can't, you know, do we have to keep looking at ospreys? We're done, right? Just move on. Um, but it, it's good. It's good to keep studying common things, especially when they're big, obvious, popular, and cool. You can do citizen science projects with them because they're easy, relatively easy to observe. People like them. Um, their nesting behavior is very much out in the open. Uh, this isn't some you know little warbler hiding its nest in the canopy of a tree. And then this history of sensitivity to environmental insults um, means they're a sentinel species. So it's worth continuing to keep an eye on these guys, even post-recovery. And they're certainly linked with the health of our co coastal ecosystems here, our herring runs and um, our other fish populations. Um, so worth, worth keeping an eye on these guys. And while, while other things that eat fish like um, cormorants in the 80s and, and now seals are not very popular with people to, to a point of absolute absurdity, very little facts underlying the hatred of uh, seals in particular, but somehow the ospreys just skate by and they're just taking fish right out from under our noses. Um, but they don't eat stripers, so it's okay. They, yeah, they don't, don't worry about it. Oh, let it in there. Well, for, for whatever reason, I guess ospreys are just, people don't think that they're, you know, having much of an impact. So everybody still likes ospreys. Most everybody, I think. Uh, and here's, even ospreys don't like cormorants. Get out of my nest. <clears throat> Sometimes a cormorant will try to dry its wings in an osprey nest. Um, there are places where cormorants will nest in, in osprey nests before the ospreys get back. Not so much around here, but so they don't get along very well. This was a photo from a volunteer of mine, Janet Dimitia. It's a few of her photos in here, I think. Weirdly, I have... I have a good camera, but I have almost no good photos of ospreys. I just have been incredibly lazy about taking good photos of ospreys here on the Cape. Luckily, other people do it for me. Um, we have a, a lot of local literature uh, about ospreys here, adding to their popularity. David Gessner's books, um, he was in, he's a professor of English and writing, and he wrote a couple of works of popular popular nonfiction about ospreys. Um, Soaring with Fidel is one where he follows their migration down to Cuba. And then Return of the Osprey was um, watching a pair of ospreys in Dennis. And then of course, Alan Poole and his a Natural and Unnatural History of Ospreys. And um, he now has a new book that is Ospreys, The Revival of a Global Raptor, available online and probably in a bookstore near you. The migration is, is fascinating too. I mean, just incredible migrations, just adding to their their popularity and just the wow factor around these birds as if they needed more. Um, they undergo these sort of death-defying, risky migrations, sometimes straight over the ocean from Martha's Vineyard to Cuba in the middle of hurricane season, which doesn't seem very bright, but but they seem to be able to do it. Um, and I'll I'll get to this more later. This is Rob, Rob Beauregard's satellite tracking data. So the goals of my project going back to 2008, uh, inventory and map existing nests here on the Cape with the help of volunteers who would send me nest coordinates um, for nests we don't know about, and then use volunteers to monitor productivity. So that's how many chicks survive to fly on their own, which is fledging. So how many chicks fledged per pair is the, the metric that we use. Discover and map patterns of nest success across the Cape, you know, looking for good and bad nesting areas. We get a lot of requests and um, requests to help put up new poles and also just consult on locations and our data can help with that. And then to compare with other populations like the vineyard population, Westport River, um, Mass Audubon is involved in monitoring both of those populations. So we sort of have multiple Mass Audubon Osprey projects that do things a little bit differently. 
one of our goals going forward is to try to unify that a little bit. Talk about that later. So very old fashioned still, um, embarrassingly so, it was like a physical data sheet you can get, like a piece of paper <laughs> that I could send you as a file and you can print it out or you can just do it, keep track of things digitally in a Word document and send it to me at the end of the season. Um, which is some, some basic information and then what you see during your visits, number of chicks, number of adults. And um, it can be surprisingly hard to count these chicks as, as busy, uh, as big as they are, depending on where, where the nest is and how high it is. And depending on how busy everybody is, they're fledging in July and August when everybody's the most busy on the Cape with visitors and everything else. Um, so it, it can be challenging. And then we have instructions on the back, key behaviors, to, um, milestones to look for, um, type of fish being brought. That, that's usually difficult. I do have one person who does that, and I'll get to that. Um, in terms of mapping, we figured out a while back that you can use Google Earth. Um, I like, I prefer the software, the free software that anybody can get and use on your laptop, or your desktop, or a phone or a, a tablet, um, where you can just, you know, zoom in on the satellite maps, the aerial, the aerial imagery maps, actually. Um, and you can actually see poles. So if you see this little green dot, and then there's this funny little shadow that looks like a lollipop, you can find osprey nests. Um, the ones that are on poles are quite easy because they're, they're out in the open and they have that distinctive shadow. And then even when they're on telephone poles, um, you can, you'll see that round shadow of the, of the nest sitting on top of the, the utility pole. And so it's a good way, easy way to kind of armchair ground truth the nest locations that we have in our database. You can do this too at home after you find your house. Hey, that's my house. Then you can go and look for osprey nests. Uh, I used to be much better about having end of season meetings, pre-season meetings for my volunteers. They basically abandoned my poor volunteers. Um, too many other things going on, but we would have, I would have like awards such as the best quote from the data sheet award. In this case, Kate Walls, this is very old. Uh, was, but it's a great quote, was very unimpressed with <laughs> Osprey mating behavior. Um, this guy, Don Henderson, down on Lewis Bay um, in Yarmouth, he's got a uh, hole right outside his back window, basically, that he can keep close track of. He used to send me 11 pages a year on just one nest, <laughs> uh, which was actually really cool. Really, really detailed information on one nest was actually Quite useful. Uh, yeah, the Walmart, Walmart and Falmouth used to be the most overwatched nest. I'd have like six or seven people send me data, fledged data from the same nest because it was in a Walmart park parking lot. I don't even know, I don't know the status of that nest anymore. Maybe someone could put it in the chat. And the, the good housekeeping award. Ospreys are pack rats, and so we you can't really see into nests very often because they're, they're a little bit high, but some of the nests have cameras on them. And this one at Barnstable High School, uh, you can see that they're, they're not very tidy. There's just trash in there. And the ironic thing is that there's a whisk broom, like, like they need to tidy up now and again. Uh, just seaweed, they like to put, sometimes you'll see an osprey swoop down onto a beach. And some people are like, are they hunting the plovers? But they're just picking up seaweed for their nest. And you can see some codium in there, some of that, that green invasive seaweed. Uh, you know, they're like us, they, they like to garden. Um, so th this is some, uh, what is this? Baccarus or Iva probably growing, growing in an osprey nest. So I mean, they use the same nests over and over again. So they accumulate all kinds of debris and, you know, they get bigger uh, and so, there are other birds nesting in the structure of the nest, like house sparrows and plants are growing in them. They just become this whole community. All right, so my project, this is back in um, 2007, oops. Um, just a few really on the outer Cape, a, a few people out there would send us information on, on nests that they were watching and 
a lot of these were polls that were put up by Dennis Murley at Mass Audubon Wellfleet Bay, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and then I expanded the scope, with some other folks involved in mapping. Craig Gibson mapped a ton of nests in Falmouth and on the Elizabeth Islands. Uh, there were other people that were really helpful early on in sending me coordinates of nests so I could get them into the database. Um, and in 2009, I had an intern who was skilled with GIS and he was traveling around the Cape, um, checking on some of these nest locations, mapping new locations. We had really, really good data back in, this was a long time ago now, but it just gives you a sense. Things are not much different now, except there are more nests, um, but the productivity is still very high. And if you look at these circles, green circles means that that nest fledged three chicks which is way more than they need to fledge to maintain the population. You're talking about a bird that lives 25 years. They have a long time to replace themselves in the population. They don't need to be pumping out two chicks a year. And so it's clear that this is a successful and growing population. And um, this still seems to be the case today from the smaller subset of nests that I get data on. Um, the, the fledging success, meaning the number of chicks that survive to fly away on their own, is still very high. I mean, look at look at like uh, Bourne, you know, Upper Upper Buzzards Bay here, Falmouth, this area, just tons of nests fledging two chicks and a ridiculous number in this particular year fledging three chicks. And then the occasional nest where you have a, a stud male that fledges four chicks. 2013, um, same kind of thing. Lots of lots of three chick fledging nests especially just born just um, for whatever reason. And then all along Nantucket Sound, lots of very productive nests, but two, two is really good. I mean, you know, all these yellow circles, that's a lot. That's a lot of fledged chicks. Um, increasingly, I'm just using Google Earth to, to keep track of this. It's easier to use than, than GIS. Um, and then, so here's kind of the spread of nests across the Cape. And then zooming in to Falmouth, this is totally out of date. I mean, Kevin Friel is finding nests that have probably been around five or more years that I don't have in my database. So this is this is not all of the nests in Falmouth by, by any stretch. And so there's a lot, you know, there, <laughs> there are a lot of ospreys in Falmouth. I really like that area. And it's so different than the Outer Cape. I'm an Outer Cape guy. And the town of Churro has one nest. I don't know of any in Provincetown. So very different out here. The National Seashore, for the most part, um, does not have poles the, the way the rest of the Cape does, artificial poles. So the osprey are sort of on their own once you get north of East Ham. Um, well, north of Wellfleet. Um, so it, it, it's always amazing to me to go to your part of the world and just the, the sheer number of ospreys is, is astounding. And that creates conflicts. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, just going through 2018, a couple of years behind here and tabulating some of this, but um, the total number fledged doesn't mean much other than it, it reflects volunteer effort in that particular year. It doesn't accurately reflect the real output of the offspring that's on the Cape. Um, but so look at the productivity. That's um, a, um, a per pair figure. So that that you can interpret. So it's always very high, like I said. O average over that 10 year span, 10 year plus span is 1.59 chicks per pair, which again, because they live a long time is way higher than it needs to be to maintain the population. So they are doing great. Looking at this by town, and again, this just reflects the number of volunteers in any given year and the number of volunteers in the, those particular towns. But but still, it's clear that Falmouth, Bourne, and Barnstable are the, the real heavyweights. Um, sandwich, has, it's quite a few. Um, so the total for that 10 or 11 year period is 1,800 chicks fledged. And that's not, that's that's just what we know about. That's not at all the real total. So that's astounding. It, and so I did a little math, assuming the kind of draconian 
conventional wisdom figure that 80, draconian is not the right word, grim statistic that 80% of birds in their first don't survive their first year. So young birds in their first year, the thing that they're best at is dying. And that's just the reality. And um, 80% has been sort of a rule of thumb. So if that's, even if that's true, these 1800 chicks um, reflect 400, more than 400 new adults. And again, that's just that we know about, which would probably translate into about 150 new nests. And uh, so where are we putting these birds? <laughs> Uh, I don't remember whose photo this is, but I, it's it's a remarkable one because it's pretty uncommon for them to fledge four chicks, and it reflects how good that particular male is at fishing. I, I said stud male, and it's true, um, at least with respect to fishing, because the male does almost all of the fishing in most cases, while the female stays at the nest, does all almost all the incubation, if not all of it. She does all the feeding. Um, and a lot of the defense of the chicks just sort of sticks by the nest while the male brings in fish for everybody. So his fishing prowess is, is the difference between fledging one chick and, and four chicks. So um, this, this guy was a good fisherman, or had a good territory with easy pickings. Um, I did this a few years ago for a conference I was presenting at. I just took what I knew about the population on the Cape in the 70s and then at the time, you know, five years ago, um, I just fit fit a curve to the two and it, I fit an exponential curve just from what I know about how endangered species recover. Um, so this was totally made up, but then it turned out that's exactly what the real data looked like. This was the mass breeding, Massachusetts breeding bird survey trend from the basically that same period. Um, in terms of birds per breeding bird survey route. And it was, it's been an exponential increase. Oh, look, it's a photo I took, which is very rare in this presentation. And I seem to do most of my photography or, or did most of my photography when I was leading international tours. And I took this photo in Belize and you might notice the head is very pale. This is the resident Caribbean race of osprey. Um, and while I was taking this photo, somebody was rifling through my backpack around the corner, stealing my wallet, but it was worth it. It was a good photo. Um, the vineyard. So Gus Ben David's work putting up poles in the dark blue. And you can see that as he put up poles, the ospreys came and eventually they plateaued for a while. But my understanding is that there are a hundred pairs out there now, um, or at least 80. And so it did, tick up again after plateauing for a while in the 2000s. And these all look very similar to the piping plover recovery uh, over time. And it's just, you get exponential growth when you fix whatever the problem was that was limiting the population, then you get exponential growth for a while until the population gets to a certain point where they're competing with each other, it's getting overcrowded, it, the predators catch on and whatever, and it, it levels off. But both piping plovers and ospreys are defying the odds because they, they're not plateauing. And piping plovers did for a while, but they've been ticking up again in, in recent years. And this is very old data. It's populations over 700 pairs now. And the ospreys I have not seen um, much evidence that they're plateauing. Uh, so this was some data from Don Henderson on Lewis Bay, who sends me the 11 pages of data. So he, he knows exactly when the male came back, when the female came back, when the first egg was laid, you know, all of the kind of stuff that I would love to have for every nest on the Cape, but is not realistic. Um, but I particularly uh, was appreciative of him tallying the different kinds of fish and so he would have daily totals, you know, he'd be like, oh, the male brought in 18 scup today. Um, so this was really enlightening. And that reflects, you know, Lewis Bay, Hyannis Harbor, you, if you tow a net around there at that time of year, you catch mostly scup. So, you know, they're catching what was available. But some interesting fish in here, fl flounder and fluke, um, 
sea robin, dogfish, needlefish. Uh, but the vast majority of the fish that they fed to the chicks there were scup. But they can catch pretty much any fish that either comes near the surface or comes into shallow enough water that they can just pin them against the bottom. These big, these big flounder here. You wouldn't think they'd be able to get a flounder that big, but they will come into shallow water. The nest types, looking at what I have in my database, 60% of them are platforms that somebody put up for the birds and then 7% in, in a tree, which is kind of funny. Obviously, they only nested in trees, um, you know, 400 years ago or whatever. Um, but we, humans have been training them to nest on artificial artificial structures for a long time. They, they used to put up um, a wet, like a wagon wheel on top of a post to encourage ospreys to nest around coastal farms. They thought they would help keep, scare away the red-tailed hawks that were eating their chickens. Um, so we've been training them for a long time to nest on artificial structures, which is why they nest on cell towers and utility poles that you look at the design of utility poles. We've known that birds nest on them for many, 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 many years, and they still keep designing telephone poles, you know, not updating the design. So it just looks like a place where an osprey wants to nest, um, which is not, not helping anybody. Um, chimneys, there are parts of the Cape, they're like those parts of the Cape where you have the, the houses that have the four chimneys um, and they often have osprey nests on them. Light towers on baseball fields, that's a, a growth, a growth sector of the osprey real estate market. Um, they like they like those tall baseball field lights. Other um, docks, rocks, the ground sometimes uh, when they get desperate. Here's an other, somebody's fishing boat in Chatham. And so technically under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, you would have to get a permit to um, to remove a nest once it has eggs in it. And they, they nest pretty early. They nest in April and people have not always come back and looked at their boats and their houses by then. And so they set up shop in inconvenient places for people. Um, but once they have eggs, you need to get a federal depredation permit to do anything. Um, hopefully you would try to move it to a new platform that's been successfully done at time. I, you know, whoever this was that owned this boat, I don't think they got a <laughs> federal permit, but the nest was just gone one day when, when they needed to go fishing. But there's a lot of this, and, and this has been a problem for a long time, where this just looks like a perfect place for an osprey to nest, and it's not good for the ospreys, and it's not good for the grid, um, because they kept on fire, and they cause local outages, in some cases, year year after year, I know of a nest in Yarmouth, which is where Eversource is headquartered on the Cape. But there's a nest in Yarmouth in a neighborhood that catches on fire every year, sometimes every other year, and you know they have not put up an alternative nesting platform for them for some reason or or really addressed it. But this is typically what they do: they will just rip down the nest. Um, usually before there are eggs. I'm not sure, but I'm sure they have permits to do more than that, but, and then they'll put up something like this as a deterrent um, but not give them an alternative place to nest. So the ospreys are sort of hanging around, scratching their heads, trying, you know, bringing, bringing in sticks to this that then fall on the ground, or they manage to build anyway, or they build on the next pole down. It's just not a very proactive way to go about this for, for Eversource. It's something we're constantly bumping heads with. There are things you can do. You can, you know, put in a taller pole with, with the nest above it. I mean, they can add these short lengths of insulator over the live part of the wires if they wanted. I talked about that in some meetings with Eversource. I'm not sure why they don't do that more often. But mostly they just uh, rip them down and put up a half culvert and literally say they need to go nest in trees. That's a, like a direct quote from one of the line crew supervisors. So there's still, Eversource is still not really getting it, um, but we're continuing to work with them to, to try to help them to get it. 
I get I get their perspective. It's a big it can be a big problem. It can be difficult to find a place to put up an alternative poll. This is a grim picture, uh, but this is what happens. I mean, you have um, a big bird with a big wingspan nesting where there's live electrical wires, um, and this is the kind of thing that happens. And so, this is what we want to avoid. Um, you know, Appreciate some better policy. There's two dead birds there, and this this is it's not like there's no, nothing to guide them. I mean, this is a document that's been around since 2006 for very very specific proscriptions for what they should be doing and ways you can keep them off the poles by you know redesigning the poles, using insulators, all that kind of thing. And Eversource is a signatory on this document, but they don't practice it in mass in on the Cape. Um, as far as I can tell. So that's an ongoing battle. We are meeting with them. Um, we being um, me, Ian Ives from our Long Pasture Sanctuary, um, folks from Cape Wildlife and from uh, and Stephanie from Wild Care in East Ham. Um, they've been trying to meet with Eversource regularly to, to influence their practices for the better. So this is a fun thing that we did years ago where we worked with Rob Beauregard to put a satellite transmitter on an, a juvenile osprey at a nest at Boat Meadow Creek in East Ham. We named her Goody Hallett after the pirate um, Black Sam Bellamy's girlfriend who lived in East Ham. Um, so Rob came out, put, put the noose carpet up in the nest, baited with a frozen herring and come in, they're not hurt, grab grab the bird, fits them with the satellite transmitter um, with a fitted sort of Teflon backpack, lets them go. And then it's just so cool. You just get real time data on this bird. And so she hung around, she hung around East Ham for a while, well fleet a little bit, basically just going from kettle pond to kettle pond, learning how to fish. And then one day she just took off and headed inland she went across the bay, um, across Plymouth County, up into New Hampshire briefly, and the Connecticut River for a while here, and then down. And sort of, and you'll see, I, I think she really imprinted on rivers here and just became a river osprey. And so from there, she kind of hightailed it down here to the Delaware River um, and up to this obscure river in Pennsylvania, the Lackawaxen River, made a field trip over to the Hudson River at one point. So just became, um, I heard my three-year-old wake up from his nap, just became a, a, a river loving osprey. So spent a lot of time on this Lackawaxen River in very rural Pennsylvania um, and was there for, quite a long time to at least mid-October before finally doing a very normal osprey migration where you head down the coast, you know, coastal New Jersey, down as far as the Carolinas. And then an adult would probably be more likely to hug the coast down to Cuba. The young ones are more likely to be reckless, just like people, and they fly out over the water and they pretty much all go through Cuba. Uh, Cuba is the one place where you can see flocks of migrating osprey, which is not really a thing almost anywhere else. And then from there, they keep going down to northern South America, typically, as far as Brazil. And so, you know, she ended up in Venezuela and seemed to be settled in. And I knew she was going to be there for the next year and a half. It's at least, and so I sort of stopped paying attention. But then one day after a couple of months, she got up and flew another 800 miles into just heart of darkness, Amazonia. Um, and so, you know, what was she doing? She, she was looking for the biggest river of all. She was looking for the Amazon. Um, I don't know what happened to her. Well, you know, we can tell ourselves stories you know, she ran afoul of a harpy eagle, she dropped her transmitter and she's still out there, who knows, but this is a, a really cool aerial photograph of that area, um, just different tributaries of the Amazon. 
don't think she quite made it to the big river. But we learned a lot from Goody. She traveled more than 4,000 miles. This is just you know, one way. Um, but the young birds tend to do this. They, it's spread out over 31 days of actual migration, averaging only 134 miles per day. The adults would be more. They're, they don't screw around. They just, they just go. But these young ones are just taking their time, wandering around, exploring. Um, and these migration days were spread out over 114 calendar days. So um, definitely, she definitely took her time. Um, it's just interesting behavior by these young ones relative to the adults who, like I said, um, do not screw around. A little bit on, you know, putting up a pole, which we don't have a lot of chances to do. It's kind of a big effort. Um, not something we have a budget for. This was just some photos from one that we did in Chatham, working with AmeriCorps, using some of my, some of my former coworkers using primitive tools here for some reason. Um, hoisting it up, the telephone poles are tough to work with. Um, I'm thinking that Chris Walls is discovering that these six by sixes are easier to do. They're not as heavy. And so you dig a trench and you um, angle it in and, and hoist it up heavy ropes, try to get it straight, takes a lot of people, bury it in, give it some struts for support, and uh, hope the ospreys come in. So the current status of my project is it, it's sort of in limbo right now. I, you know, I appreciate data. I, I do enter the data that comes in from longtime volunteers. I don't have a ton of capacity currently to recruit. It would be so easy to recruit 150 new volunteers just because of the way Facebook is now, which wasn't as widely used as, um, you know, 10 years ago, but now everybody's on there. You know, Mike Tucker started that fa that Falmouth Wildlife Facebook group that has 4,000 people on it. 4,000 people on a town-specific Facebook group about wildlife. It's, it's awesome. Um, and I think there, there are a lot of potential volunteers lurking out there on Facebook. I just need to make sure we have developed some sort of funding and have the capacity to work with that many people. Um, we've been talking, when I say we, Andrew Vitz, the state ornithologist, um, would like to have some kind of a statewide way that we enter osprey data. Um, you know, Rob Beergard, Alan Poole, some of the other cooperators around the state um, some of my Mass Audubon colleagues trying to figure this out because even within Mass Audubon, we don't have one Osprey project. We have four, um, all, all a little bit different. And so this is a big need in Massachusetts. I would love to have online data entry, just like every other citizen science project. Um, but we need to, you know, get together on this and either have a universal one or we just have multiple, multiple Osprey projects. So this is the new thing. The, the bald eagle population is going up and up. There's probably multiple pairs nesting on the Cape. You know, they're hanging out by, what is it, Oyster Pond there now. There's eagles hanging out on an osprey nest, mating in full view, you know, downtown Falmouth. Um, this was taken by Janet Timotia in Harwich a few weeks ago. And so I used to get these early osprey reports in you know January and February, and I would say, oh, it's a great blackback gull or a or a um, red-tailed hawk sitting on a nest, and usually that's what it turns out to be. Increasingly, it's bald eagles sitting on an osprey nest, and this is a new a new thing for us on the Cape where they're thinking about nesting more and more of these eagles, and they're they're doing that in January and February before the ospreys come back, and so. Something has to give when those ospreys come back. And typically they are able to fight off the bald eagles. It's happened a lot um, around the big ponds of Lakeville, Lakeville, where there's been an established eagle population for many years and nesting ospreys. That despite being smaller and usually losing the battles over fish, an osprey is very, very motivated to keep its nesting site and will just kick the crap out of a bald eagle until it leaves. And this happened on Martha's Vineyard last year, where it was very excitingly was the first bald eagle nest on Martha's Vineyard in modern times. And when the ospreys came back, they were fighting the eagles. The eagles were trying to fight off the ospreys and ended up breaking the eggs. 
Um, so that that eagle nest was not successful. So this, this drama will be playing out more and more, and you guys might be able to witness it yourselves um, going forward. There's a definite eagle nest um, that fledged a chick in Barnstable last year, undisclosed location. And I, Jason Zimmer of Mass Wildlife said he knows of a couple of others on the Cape, including ones where they're sitting on an osprey nest and may not be successful, um, but also some others. So there, there's this stealth eagle nesting population here on the Cape. Just some acknowledgements here. Um, we're just about ready. That's the last slide. Yes. So we can transition to questions, I think here. I will stop sharing. Do you see the chat, Mark? Because there, yep. okay, there were okay. One question early on: When will they be, be considered pests? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the word "weed," isn't it? It's all your. It's all a matter of perspective. Yeah. I love a lot of the plants that people call weeds, and it, they're not a pest until they're until they're a pest. And so, you know, if they come in and create a problem for you on some something you own, you know, dropping sticks all over your lawn or you know, some people don't like that, then they're a pest. Otherwise, um, otherwise they're majestic. <laughs> it's, all, it's all a matter of perspective and there's no like universal, it's not like there's some statutory definition of a pest when it comes to a native species and their population levels. It's like the seals, like people's, people are like, clearly they're overpopulated. Like, yeah, relative to what? Like, where are you getting that? How do you know, do you know what their historical population was? People are just pulling stuff out of their butts and m making assumptions. Um, and with ospreys, we even with ospreys, we don't know what their historic population was. But it it stands to reason that it's way higher now than it probably was historically because of all of the artificial nest sites that we put up. And we know that their nest nesting success on those artificial poles is much higher than it would be in trees um, where, because they're further from great horned owls, their raccoons aren't getting up in there when they're hole out in the middle of a marsh. So the predation is very low. And so, yeah, I mean, I would say ospreys are the population certainly on the upper Cape is probably higher than it was historically. But um, for the most part, I don't think people consider them a pest. Eversource does. Right, of course. Um, another question. Do the osprey continue to produce chicks into old age? Yes. Yeah, this is true of animals in general. That you know, they're not like they're not like people. So and they they often get better with age. You know, they're more experienced. And so a 25-year-old female osprey um, is can be still quite productive and they they've seen it all and they know it all. And so, you know. Um, even if they somehow are not laying quite as many eggs, they could still be producing as many chicks because they, they are experienced and they know what they're doing. And they, the older ones nest earlier, which is they get back sooner, they have established nesting sites, and they nest earlier, which is, tends to correlate with better nest success. Great. Okay, here's a question from some folks who say they live along Swan River in West Dennis across from Crocker Neck Crocker Neck Marsh East, which looks like a perfect spot for an opera nest, osprey nest. Who can we contact about recommending the site and helping to fund the installation? Let's see, Dennis, that would be Ian at Long Pasture. We're trying, Ian and I are trying to figure out who gets what. Yeah. Was it, is it the Bass River that, you know, is the dividing line for who, who takes what poll requests? Um, so if you have no idea what to do, sometimes people just figure it out. They hire a contractor, you go through the CONSCOM, you get approval and you, you put up a poll. Um, but if you, you're really struggling and you don't know what to do, you can contact either Ian at Long Pasture or me and um, we, can, we might be able to provide help. But in a lot of cases, I don't know who's, who's putting up nests. I just got some information about this company. Uh, what are they called? They put up these fiberglass holes. They they have a business putting in fiberglass pilings for 
docks and things. And they created, they spun out a little side business where they make these Osprey poles. And I think it costs about a thousand dollars. If you hired the, one of the contractors that Eversource uses to put up a traditional telephone pole, it would be $2,000. Wow. Um, and I don't even think that includes putting the platform on the top. Interesting. So, but then again, you could, you might be able to get a handyman to put in a six by six one by himself or, or, you know, with a couple of neighbors or something. So somebody put up these, you know, 200 poles that are around the Cape and it wasn't me and it wasn't Mass Audubon in most cases. Um, so it's always been a bit of a mystery to me how they, how they get up. So there are different ways to do this, but again, contact us if you're really stuck. Okay. Thank you. The question from Lynn, if they mate for life, what happens if one of the pair dies? Is there a quote unquote dating scene? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Osprey Tinder. Um, they, with birds that mate for life, they don't really do any kind of mourning. They're very practical. They don't have time to mess around. They have a, it's a very, sh the, the nesting window is short um, for them to be successful because it takes such a long time for ospreys to fledge their young. It's like 40 days of incubation and then another 55 days of, dirt of the chick stage. So they, they find another mate very quickly is what I'm getting at. They don't, they don't mourn or, you know, put up a profile or, you know, there's, there are other birds around who know pretty quickly if somebody's available, however they know. And so they usually have another mate within a few days. Interesting. Great. Okay. Um, from Steve Buckingham, do pairs return to the same nest every year and do they truly mate for life? Also, do they migrate to Cuba and South America together in pairs? And if not, do we know if they ever see each other in the winter grounds? Um, yes and no. So I, we don't know if they ever see each other on the wintering grounds, but they migrate by themselves. They do, they do mate for life. They do come back to the same pole year after year, um, but they don't migrate in groups or pair. They really seem to migrate by themselves. And it's very clear if you watch them because the female typically leaves way before the male or often does. And this is true of a lot of things, shorebirds, piping plovers, the female might leave in July and then the male is sticking around until the chicks fledge. So no, they don't migrate together. And I don't think anybody has ever like satellite tracked a pair to see. My, my understanding is they don't necessarily winter in the same area. <clears throat> so, you know, it can be good for a relationship. Separate vacations can be good for a relationship. And I think Ospreys practice that. Okay, so uh, Barbara and Gary Schneider say, our platform here on Green Pond has been here since the late 80s. We've had a pair and chicks every year. Would the nesting pair be related to the original pair? Maybe. Yeah, it's hard to say. They all look alike. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have, the, the young birds have it tough. They come back, they're two or three years old. They typically will have a nest that's fake. The first year you get these play nests. And if you pay attention to ospreys, you'll see these ones. You can tell it's like, it's like, ah, oh, it's a little bit late for ospreys to be building a nest from scratch. It's because those are young birds. They're not gonna, they not, won't have eggs. They won't, certainly won't fledge young. So they're, they're housekeeping nests or play nests, we call them. Um, <clears throat> so um, they have to then, they have to secure their own site and there's not a lot of real estate left. They can wait around for their, <laughs> their parents to die, um, but that's not great for the, you know, they don't want to mate with one of their parents or something like that, but that that does happen sometimes. That was a long way of saying no with a lot of words or, okay. or we don't know. Okay, okay. There's no good way to um, tell. Steve Waxman says, a new poll just went up at Gunning Point. It's now listing quite a bit. How much is too much? Oh, I know. And that's tough because we have poles on the outer Cape that have been leaning for years, like as long as I've known about them, 13 years, they're leaning and the, the osprey is just kind of like, you know, the nest is, is still straight though the pole is like this and they sort of figure it out. In other cases, it can eventually tip over. And if it happens when there are chicks in there, 
um, that can be catastrophic. But yeah, there's no rule of thumb. It, it's nest by nest. And it's amazing how long they can persist in a pretty serious lean. We have some like that in Wellfleet. Um, and people are constantly like, when are you going to, you know, put that pole up straight? And some of them are on our list, but, um, but the birds are able to, able to deal with it. Wow. Okay. Okay. And then I think there's just one more. Um, do chicks in the nest respond to distinct calls from parents and vice versa? Hmm. Um, I would, I would guess, yes. You know, whether they can, they're not colonial. So it's not like, it's not like penguins where it's just chaos. Mm -hmm. And so they really need to be able to identify the, each other as individuals. Ospreys, you know, nobody's having trouble finding each other. So I, I would be surprised if they like really knew, but maybe they do. They might be able to identify the parent um, as an individual by their by their call. I'm not I'm not sure. It's a good question. Okay, well I think oh, um, oh here's one, one more. How do the parents teach the young to fish? What text is it? Do they have techniques or is do they just is just copying? Do they just copy? Yeah, I think they just have to figure it out on their own. Watch, watch what other birds are doing, um, and it can be tough. They'll they'll break their legs, you know. You know, um, it's it's tough to be a young bird. So I, I don't think they're like taking them by the wing and saying, "This is how you do it, Junior." But the young ones just they they typically will want to be fed longer than the adults are willing to feed them. So rather than learn to fish, they'll just keep hanging out at the nest and begging. And eventually the adults will just stop feeding them. So they need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, but I would guess it's mostly just by observing other birds and trial and error. Right. right. Uh, oops. And here they keep coming. You ready for a couple more? Yeah. Okay. One year, the father brought the two chicks to our dock rail and actually taught them how to lean over and hit the water like a child on a diving board for the first time. And watching that was hilarious. So they observed that. That's cool. That is cool. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So that shows that there is parental parental teaching. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to figure out what that means. Like hit the water like a child on a diving board for the first time. Hmm. Not a belly flop. I, yeah, I yeah, hope. yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, it is a belly flop. It's just <laughs> feet first. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, of course, right. Okay, <laughs> here's another one. When the osprey arrive here on Bourne's Pond, I hear chirping. Is that the male or the female? They both make the same sounds. It, it, the first to arrive is the male. And then two days, four days later is usually when the female shows up. The males are just strong, more strongly motivated to defend the, the nest site. Okay. And so they're in more of a hurry. But um, they make the same sounds. Okay. And somebody says, yes, the Walmart nest is still there. <laughs> yeah. Did they move it? Is it still on a light pole or did, did they put up an alternative? It's still on a light pole. Yeah. Cool. Nancy, Nancy's the first person I see next to me. <laughs> so you can just nod and I see. All right. All right. Well, I think unless anybody has another question that, concludes our talk. Thank you so much, Mark. Wonderful information. Great to see you. Nice yeah. to have spring sprung. Oh, yeah. And um, right, everybody. <laughs> yeah. And take care. Thanks, everybody for coming. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. 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 Good turnout, Mark. I taught that the top of the top of the heap was 81 and okay, 77 people know. stayed through the whole thing. So <laughs> sometimes we get more dropouts, but you didn't have any, you didn't have very many. Oh, I would have dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> because of the weather. Well, um, thanks so much for coming and doing this for us. No problem. H happy to do it. Yep. And it's great to see you and enjoy spring and your little ones. And hopefully soon we'll be out and about and really getting back to normal. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I hope so. I hope so too. Yeah. I hope so. All right. Bye. Bye. Hi, Susie.